Good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much and just for joining us for coming to the third seminar, third CSOC seminar of this term. As you know, as you all know very well, our seminar series this term focuses on diaspora studies. And basically the title of our seminar series is Comparative Diasporas Reflections on Southeast Europe. Of course, fittingly with the name of our program, we are focusing on Southeastern European diasporas. And fittingly with our location in the world, we are focusing on diasporas in the UK. And as you know, again, very well, we've got quite a strong program on Greek diaspora. And one of our main objectives in just, uh, when we came up you know, just with this program was to put that study into a comparative perspective. Uh, and hence this program, hence this you know, seminar series. With this perspective in mind, I'm very delighted to welcome tonight Dr. Elena Genoa uh, of the University of Nottingham's School of Sociology. Elena is a teaching associate at the University of Nottingham School of, School of Sociology, where she completed her PhD on Bulgarian highly skilled diaspora in the UK. In addition to her academic credentials, Elena it has a very rich and active experience in supporting asylum seekers in Nottinghamshire. I mean, she is a practitioner as well in that sense. She won the 2015 Best Postgraduate Paper Award of the University of Nottingham School of Sociology. She is teaching the sociology classes, and additionally, she is an active member of the Identities Citizenship Equalities and Migration Migration Research Center, a very comprehensive research <laughs> Quite scope. A <laughs> Quite a scope, actually. Elena's talk today will focus on the case of Bulgarian migrants in the UK to explore the contested diasporic identities in times of crises. She will draw on her fieldwork that she carried out between 2011 and 2017 quite a time span, uh, and that consisted of 62 interviews and participant observation. Her paper, that constitutes the basis of her presentation of her speech today, argues that Bulgarians in the UK reinvent their national identities to counterbalance the othering that they are exposed to, both at home in Bulgaria and in their host societies. The new Bulgarian enlighteners and the ambassadors are the two ideal types that Elena uses to examine the reinvention of this identity more in depth, more in detail. And we will hear, of course, much more about it within, the two, within, a, within a couple of minutes. And finally, who else, you know, just, to, you know, just to, be, to be the discussant of, you know, just this paper, you know, just better than, you know, just our own, you know, just Dr. Manolis Pratsinakis. Uh, Manolis hardly needs any introduction here in this room. Uh, Manolis is our own very Manolis. Uh, he is the Onassis Fellow at the DPIR, and he is one of the pillars of the Greek Diaspora Project, along with the boss, Oton and Nopotini. <laughs> Thank you very much again to all of you for coming here tonight. And Alina, without further ado, you've got the floor, please. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you for this amazing introduction. I feel quite special. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate it. So thanks to Manolis Mehmet, Oton, uh, Fatemi as well. And everybody here who is uh, tonight, uh, who has um, come here tonight um, uh, and would like to hear what I've got to say. So uh, the first thing I would like to say is that this is very much ongoing work, so I would be very interested in um, hearing what you think about it and what your opinions are about this. Uh, but before I actually tell you what I'm going to talk about, um, I just wanted to uh, tell you how the story, um, how this research came about. And as all research um, uh, does, you know, it started in a very kind of banal, mundane way. Um, so I came to do my master's uh, in the UK and when I returned for the school holidays um, my parents and I went to the shop. Now I come from a really really small town. Uh, it's very small, 5,000 people, everybody knows everybody, we're neighbours or related or both. Um, and we went to the shop 
Um, and the shop assistant looked at me and said, ah, you've got guests. Uh, how long are you visiting for? And that really struck me because, you know, I've lived most of my life in that hometown. I know that shopkeeper. I went to school with his children. My mom taught his children. We, know, uh, we all know each other. But all of a sudden he said, oh, you know, he, he described me as a guest. And the thing about like being back home in Bulgaria is uh, it's always your home or seen as, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I think that might be quite common for all Balkan countries. But you can always go back to your parents' home and it will be your home. And all of a sudden it kind of struck me that I'm no longer home. I'm seen as somebody visiting and somebody who's no longer from there. So I started wondering about this and whether um, you know other people uh, have experienced uh, this kind of everyday differentiation and how in general staying uh, or leaving the country actually intersects with this sense of belonging and sense of identity as such. Um, and uh, this is how the research uh, came about. So uh, in the next couple of minutes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I've been doing in the last uh, couple of years. And what I will argue is that Bulgarian migrants indeed experience this double-sided othering that comes both from uh, the host society but also from the home society as well. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the theoretical framework of the study um, and um, I'll talk a little bit about this notion of the other Bulgaria uh, and talk about uh, some key characteristics of migratory flows, um, uh, outflows. Um, and uh, I'll give you a bit more information about the study itself. And then the focus here is on identity. So I propose this model and um, this model of free negotiation of national identity. And as all models, as all ideal types go, it's not, it doesn't fit everybody. Um, so it obviously should be treated with caution. Uh, but it does, uh, I think it's quite interesting, quite indicative of some of the characteristics that some Bulgarians uh, tend to portray in order to counterbalance these um, strong othering discourses. Um, and also finally, I'll just uh, uh, present uh, some of the latest data that has been gathered um, post-referendum uh, with Bulgarians, uh, particularly Bulgarians who have been living in the country for quite a, uh, quite a bit more time. So, <clears throat> theoretically speaking, um, Bulgarians um, um, lead transnational lives, so they do maintain uh, links with both home and home societies. Um, so as such, what I'll be focusing on um, is how othering is resisted via the reinvention of national identity in a context that is permeated by a very strong crisis narrative. Uh, and specifically, um, I aim to demonstrate in the next few minutes um, that Bulgarian migrants in the UK find themselves in this context of double-sided othering. So leading a transnational life obviously creates a lot of opportunities, but also it creates a lot of challenges. And what I'm interested in is particularly those challenges. Um, so, what I argue, it's not Bulgarians only, I think a lot of migrants, so the presence and absence of, somebody's, of somebody from their country of origin and the presence in a, in a host society always creates problems and creates tensions. Um, and I think it's useful to think about these tensions in terms of double-sided othering, which I've previously argued is this process of um, um, the simultaneous operation of external and internal stereotypes and by internal and external here what I mean is home society and host society produce stereotypes uh, which create this um, spatially and temporally discursive realm um, where what we can observe is power renegotiations uh, re uh, which obviously impact upon migrants everyday identities and they do have very serious implications for uh, the adjustment to the host society um, but also how migrants themselves make sense of their migratory choices um, and how that impacts upon their sense of self. So in uh, thinking about identities, I mostly draw on the work of Stuart Hall, uh, probably quite a few of you are familiar with him and his discursive approach uh, to identity. Uh, identity is always fluid and it's not about being, it's about becoming and the process of becoming as such. 
Uh, and I also um, think the work of Jensen is quite useful because what he argues in relation to identification is that it's not just a passive process of categorization. Uh, it also uh, can be a strong example of oppositional agency. So um, to combine uh, these ideas, I think uh, Anthony Ellis' uh, notion of reinvention could be appropriated to some extent. So he uses reinvention actually uh, in a much broader term to describe the, the conditions that we live in. So he argues that we live in the society in um, the age of reinvention where um, the focus is on redoing and recalibrating the self. Um, so trying to refashion the self in new different ways uh, because uh, and that also links to uh, some of the work of Thomas Feist that um, actually stasis means decline and change in constantly reinventing the self uh, is what matters. So this is kind of some of, some of the theoretical grounding of the study itself. Now, why the other Bulgarian? Why have I particularly uh, used this term? So the other Bulgarian is um, it's a very politically and semantically loaded term in the uh, Bulgarian public discourse. It actually um, firstly relates to uh, a Bulgarian, a popular uh, TV show called The Other Bulgaria by a famous Bulgarian journalist called Georgi Toshev. Georgi Toshev himself was a migrant um, in uh, the United States and he came to a point when he had a choice to stay in the United States or to return um, and spend, uh, because his father was really ill at the time, so he had the choice, do I go back or do I stay? So he considers himself as a failed migrant, at least that's what he says in interviews. Um, and he never got to live this life that was abroad. So that's how he came up with the idea. He wanted to see what it meant for other people who actually decided to stay in the whole society. Uh, and he created this TV show that basically follows um, the stories of Bulgarians abroad and the challenges and the successes that they've had. Now the term itself um, has been um, also uh, politically ap appropriated by a group of people who established a political party in 2009 who claimed to represent, um, I think rather than successfully, the interests of all immigrants abroad. So it's not a very prominent uh, or strong political party. But semantically speaking, um, the term is really politicized and um, quite a few uh, migrants that have seen the uh, TV show or talk about the other Bulgaria uh, find it really problematic because the fact that we use the term the other Bulgaria somehow suggests that they're two different Bulgarians and one is different from the other. Whereas the logic usually should be that all Bulgarians are one uh, and they shouldn't be divided, so there shouldn't be this separation. But semantically speaking, the term itself has been associated with diaspora, with belonging, with loss as well. So a lot of conflicted and contested uh, emotions and I thought it was really um, appropriate to um, kind of represent this, content, um, this uh, uh, arena of contestation that I'll be looking at tonight. Mm -hmm. So the focus will be particularly on the Bulgarian diaspora in the UK, but I'll give you a brief overview of uh, Bulgarian migratory outflows quite selectively uh, and purposefully selected um, for tonight's presentation. But um, the statistical information about Bulgarian support actually vary, uh, varies quite significantly. So um, I cannot guarantee that the information I presented here is actually correct. Uh, because it really depends on the, the source that you consult. Uh, but according to data from the OECD, um, the country has lost 6% of its population only between 1992 and 2012. And that percentage rises if we consider the economically active. Um, it rises to 10%. Um, according to Eurostat data, uh, which is uh, represented over there, that focuses on the latest migratory flows that are within the European Union, um, there's a redirection to migratory flows and uh, between uh, around 9% or 48,000 Bulgarians are estimated uh, to live in the UK. Um, the Office for National Statistics uh, um, has um, cited 56,000. Uh, the Agency for Bulgarians Abroad has cited around, unofficially, around 100,000. So 
I think uh, an educated guess would be between 48,000 and 100,000 people. Um, it's not, uh, as you can see, it's not by far the biggest, uh, so the Bulgarian diaspora in, in the UK is not by far the biggest. Um, within Europe, uh, that certainly is Germany. Uh, but there are, there is a very strong Bulgarian uh, diasporic presence in neighboring countries such as Greece, um, obviously in Turkey, um, but also um, the Netherlands uh, is quite a popular student destination as well. So, quite selectively, I've decided to um, give you a brief historical overview of migratory flows, and I think in a minute it will uh, become clear why I've chosen those particular periods, because here and there I do miss a few years. But um, migration has always been um, an integral part of the history of the Bulgarian nation. Um, and I wanted to start from the period of Bulgarian revival, so late uh, 18th, uh, early 19th century. So at that time, uh, Bulgaria had already been under Ottoman rule for five centuries. Um, but um, the Ottoman Empire was trading quite a bit with Europe, uh, which benefited Bulgarian merchants who got quite rich. And they decided to invest that capital into their children. So they started sending their children to study abroad, predominantly to Russia and other um, uh, European countries. Um, and um, at the time, um, all these people who were migrating to uh, Europe, they encountered the Enlightenment and all these ideas uh, about liberty and freedom. And they decided to return to the country and bring back those ideas and revive the nation, um, which resulted in a revolutionary movement and separate, so the kind of uh, historian, um, scholars such as uh, uh, the Skolov point out that um, the Bulgarian revival can roughly be organized around three broad streams. One was organized around the movement for an independent church, uh, but also an educational movement and also a revolutionary one. So uh, that was a very important period of time in Bulgarian history that um, tried to revive na uh, uh, national consciousness. And even the term in Bulgarian is called Vazrajdan, so it's uh, translated into English, it means awakening. So a time when um, the, the focus was on uh, kind of uh, inspiring national consciousness and give it the sense of Bulgarians as, as belonging to a nation, to a group of people with a common history, a history that they should be proud of. So a lot of, a lot of that migration was uh, particularly towards Europe, but also it was very firmly associated with return. The next period, so kind of fast forward a few years, so shortly before uh, and after the Second World War, um, there was quite a bit of Bulgarian migration. Um, uh, the so-called Gurbet, so people um, uh, choosing to do seasonal work, uh, and uh, two particular groups of migrants around that time were Bulgarian gardeners um, and students. So students had the opportunity to go and study in Western countries such as France and Germany and some in, uh, came to the UK, uh, particularly on the basis of bilateral agreements. So there were really small migratory flows, again associated with, um, uh, with return, but uh, uh, specifically with the gardeners, um, Actually, that was quite a prestigious um, profession at the time, and uh, Bulgarian gardeners were really valued for their expertise. Um, and uh, even uh, the methods that it, they introduced in quite a lot of, uh, so a lot of the migrations actually um, directed towards Central Europe, so countries such as Hungary, um, Czechoslovakia, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, a lot of the methods that Bulgarian gardeners introduced at the time are still taught at particularly Hungarian universities uh, uh, um, in terms of horticultural degrees. And then the next period is the period of communism, which um, can be characterized by strong state control. So migration um, at the time uh, was um, highly controlled by the Bulgarian Communist Party but also uh, punished, um, and uh, because, of, because of that, it also acquired strong emotive connotations. So if uh, someone um, left the country without the permission of, um, 
uh, the, uh, the Communist Party, uh, the property could be seized and uh, they could be um, jailed for 10 years uh, and there were all sorts of repercussions for their family as well. There was a small um, uh, kind of stream of student migration at the time but again based um, on um, bilateral agreements and uh, usually that migration tend to be, uh, tended to be quite privileged and associated with part party membership of uh, the students, family, um, and a few, uh, so one the, once uh, those places were filled by uh, those favoured uh, by the Communist Party, then they were open to uh, the public as well. So it was highly controlled, uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, political immigration at the time, so political refugees uh, who were persecuted because of their political views uh, who left the country at the time. And then things changed uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, similar processes uh, began in Bulgaria. Not um, Bulgaria didn't arguably have a strong dissident movement, not as strong as uh, Solidarność in Poland, for example. Uh, but in a similar manner, um, people, uh, Bulgarian people at the time were quite optimistic about the transition to democracy, um, which quickly became substituted with disillusionment of how those political changes were actually carried out because the first democratic elections were uh, actually won by the Bulgarian Socialist Party, the Reformed Communist Party, and so on and so forth. And also that followed the period of uh, economic instability. So the early 90s, 1990, 1991, uh, so uh, a coupon system and shortage of uh, uh, food and gas and electricity. Um, Bulgarian industries crashed, uh, which um, led to high um, rise of uh, unemployment uh, and eventually uh, hyperinflation that um, um, crashed the uh, banking sector in 1995-96. So quite a turbulent time of transition and change and this had very strong social implications for the people. So according to um, um, Kalinova and Baeva, uh, that period divided the people into the winners and the losers of the transition. And uh, those people who were really disillusioned, they decided to leave. So strong migratory flows, particularly in the early 90s, were towards Western countries, some to the UK, but predominantly US and Canada. Uh, and most of these people were highly educated, highly skilled um, individuals. Um, and at the time, actually, as Anna Christopher notes, um, most of their degrees weren't recognized in Western universities, so they had to um, retake exams. Uh, for example, doctors, their medical degrees weren't recognized, so they had to, again, retake exams, um, and so on and so forth. Now, things started changing in the late 90s, uh, so quite a few of the migratory uh, flows uh, were redirected towards neighboring countries, so popular destinations became Greece, um, purely for uh, the proximity of the country. Also, Spain was a popular destination as well, um, arguably because Spanish is an easy language to learn for Bulgarians. Um, but um, kind of the next period that arguably also changed the outlook of Bulgarian mi uh, migratory flows was when Bulgaria joined the EU. And according to, in 2007, and according to uh, scholars such as um, Anna Kristeva, those uh, post-accession migratory flows uh, were much more open-ended and drama-free. Um, and uh, purely because people didn't have um, uh, any restrictions, they could f uh, travel freely within the European Union, uh, their degrees recognized, and so on and so forth. But, um, and this is the, particularly the period that I've mainly fo uh, focused on, uh, and specifically migratory flows towards the UK. But what I found quite interesting in my own research is how various characteristics from each one of these migratory flows actually combine themselves in new ways. Uh, and we can see some of them in post-accession migratory flows, particularly the strong emotive connotations of seeing migration as um, a form of escapism or even treason uh, in some cases, as I'll um, demonstrate in a second. Um, and particularly when we talk about escapism and um, uh, treason, uh, in Bulgarian public discourse, um, Terminal 1 and 2 of Sofia Airport uh, have a very strong discursive presence. And I, uh, I came across this joke a long time ago, and I just 
I just thought it captures really nicely uh, the, the, the biggest tension um, that surrounds migration. So, um, firstly, in Bulgaria, there's also the perception of the, that the transition is never ending and never ended. So, there's this ongoing crisis and transition. Um, which at various periods has prompted people to leave the country because they've seen their degrees, they're valued, um, they've seen lots of opportunities for professional realization. But um, this, uh, this little anecdote um, goes, uh, question, what are the two solutions to the crisis in Bulgaria? And the answer is Terminal 1 and 2. <laughs> so Terminal 1 and 2 are then seen as, you know, at best as a form of escapism, right? We need to, you know, this ship sinking, we need to go elsewhere. Or uh, at worst, you know, um, those who stay behind um, sometimes interpreted as, as um, you know, uh, that people are not strong enough to endure the hardship in Bulgaria. So I think this uh, little anecdote actually really nicely captures some of the tensions that can be observed at, uh, in the Bulgarian public discourse between stayers and leavers, between migrants and non-migrants. And this tension is quite persistent um, and it's uh, at particularly critical points it kind of resurfaces in the public uh, discourse and not even um, even on social media there was a campaign organized by Bulgarian students in solidarity with uh, the students who occupied the Sofia University during the 2013 protests so they did a little video and a post saying you know we stand in solidarity with um, the students in Sofia and somebody posted well uh, when Bulgaria is Glasgow exactly, you know, you're not a proper Bulgarian. So these kind of discourses keep on coming across, uh, particularly at critical points. And um, what I want to explore today is this ongoing narrative of crisis um, and how it affects the sense of belonging and identity of uh, Bulgarian migrants uh, specifically. But this perception of crisis is, um, I think, uh, is something that can be observed in other countries as well, not Bulgaria um, only. Uh, yet at the same time, um, migration as such is not only negatively perceived in the Bulgarian public discourse. In fact, there's a, a very um, strong recognition, particularly um, from the government, uh, that uh, brain drain is a huge problem and quite a few efforts over the years um, have been directed towards trying to entice um, those highly educated uh, people because predominantly what's quite interesting about migra uh, migratory flows from Bulgaria, they tend to be highly skilled and mostly young people. Um, so quite a lot of uh, migratory flows, that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, governmental initiatives have tried to uh, focus precisely on this and I've selectively again listed a couple of them but uh, the cost of government um, initiated mm -hmm. a campaign called the Bulgarian Easter, which was meant to entice, uh, again, young, highly skilled um, uh, migrants to return, p professionals and um, um, work in Bulgaria, but uh, that uh, uh, quickly failed and faded uh, as soon as they lost the next elections. Um, additionally, um, th these efforts um, to kind of maintain uh, Bulgarian national identity and um, support Bulgarian culture abroad and work towards return have been institu institutionalized uh, by the State Agency for Bulgarians Abroad. This was originally actually established in 1992 and in 2002 it acquired the, state, um, uh, the, the status of a state agency. Um, and uh, this is uh, the State Agency for Bulgarians Abroad actually uh, again, focuses on uh, supporting Bulgarian culture, spirit, Bulgarian communities abroad by initiating lots of different competitions, um, student competitions, writing essays, promoting Bulgarian culture and work abroad, but also sponsoring events such as Korea and Bulgaria, Why Not?, which is an initiative, again, directed towards um, young, highly educated uh, Bulgarians uh, and hoping for them to uh, return. They also work very closely with organizations such as Tuktam and Back to BG. Both of these organizations um, create net networking platform for highly skilled individuals uh, so they can exchange ideas and uh, think about how they can implement their expertise and their knowledge in, in Bulgaria. Briefly in 2009, the Borisov uh, cabinet also established the um, uh, minister without portfolio for Bulgarians abroad, very briefly, that idea crashed and burned uh, after a few very controversial statements that the said minister made. 
but also th uh, this, um, uh, these efforts to attract the other Bulgarian, kind of build these bridges with the Bulgarian diaspora, um, have been firmly embedded in national strategies um, of the Republic of Bulgaria regarding migration and integration. Uh, the, uh, the most current one is uh, until 2020. Um, this also has been slightly controversially perceived by particularly some migrant communities because uh, the focus, uh, um, the argument that has been for, uh, put forward in some of my interviews is that the government should actually be working more on reasons for people not to leave rather than you know, enticing people to uh, come back. But I'll come back to that. And also, as I said, um, this kind of ongoing uh, perception of crisis and uh, narrat uh, the, the, uh, the narrative of crisis has not been something that characterizes Bulgaria as such, but also it's been something that could be observed in the uh, whole society as such. Um, and here I'm going to spend considerably uh, less um, time talking about this because uh, I'm sure you're much more familiar uh, with that. But um, there are, I think there are roughly three key tendencies that we can observe uh, in the British approach to migration that tie in with the overall narrative of crisis. So the first thing um, that we can observe is uh, this shift away from multiculturalism, so the management of migration and shift towards new, assim uh, new assimilationism. Uh, but also what we can observe, the second thing is a stricter immigration policy. Um, which uh, can be exemplified by the hostile environment approach uh, and it can be clearly seen that in the 2014 and 2016 Immigration Act um, that uh, firmly embedded the policy of everyday bordering so landlords or doctors having to check the immigration status and obviously that is not directed towards Bulgarian or just European migrants but towards migration in general and the final very obvious tendency is stronger Euroscepticism and it, it wasn't just the rise of UKIP, well, it's not even just Brexit that's currently happening. Um, but I think also uh, we've, we've seen these uh, stronger sent uh, sentiments in the rise of hate crimes post-referendum but also how this has been reaffirmed with uh, the Brexit immigration bill that was passed on Monday as well in the House of Commons. Um, so in general, there have been quite strong anti-immigrant sentiments um, and I firmly believe that this is uh, associated with larger dissatisfactions uh, towards the political stat status quo and the economic situation in the country as such. Now, Bulgarians uh, in this context um, have featured uh, briefly before 2007, particularly early 90s and early noughties, around a few uh, visa scam scandals, uh, which associated Bulgarians with criminality. Uh, but between 2014, uh, 2007, 2014, that was a time when uh, Bulgarians and Romanians actually more firmly um, uh, featured in uh, the British public discourse around whether or not um, the British government should impose labour restrictions um, as soon as they joined the EU. So many of you um, might remember that those labour restrictions, so any mem EU, uh, EU member state had the right to impose labour restrictions for a period up, <coughs> up to seven years from the date of a given country joining, and that could be done on a period of two plus three plus two years. So for Bulgarians, uh, that period, uh, so, every, every, so the first after the first two years, uh, they had to revise uh, whether there was any threat to uh, the labor market and then after three years the same. So every single time when a revision was near, the Bul Bulgarians and Romanians came um, very kind of prominently in the uh, public discourse and then disappeared again. But I think more broadly, Bulgarians as such have been uh, referred to uh, in relation to the, the larger term of Eastern European. And this, uh, this term is, uh, as uh, it has been recognized by scholars, uh, there's a special issue in population space in place that just came out uh, a few months ago, where there are a few excellent papers on Brexit and European migrants. And quite a few of them recognize that the term Eastern European is really problematic because it metonymically represents a huge group of people that are culturally very different. Uh, it represents... Uh, it serves as a metonymical representation of everybody who lives east of Germany and Austria. And 
the, the, the fact is that Central and Eastern Europeans actually are quite more divisive, uh, particularly in interviews. Um, and it's been quite interesting because the, the, the very term Eastern European has also very uh, negative connotations. So um, if, you look, uh, if you look at the work of Laura Morosciano, for example, uh, with John Fox, um, they've written a lot about how metonymically um, Eastern European migrant usually serves to represent somebody who's unskilled, potentially a benefit tourist, um, uh, uneducated criminal and so on and so forth. So very negative connotations. And Bulgarians have been lumped together, uh, usually with Romanians, but also with uh, other Central and Eastern Europeans and kind of discussed in that context. So um, it's quite interesting because I spoke to a lot of my participants and uh, they were really happy when the labour restrictions were finally lifted uh, and they no longer had to apply for uh, restrictions and then Brexit happened and they said well now everybody can see what it is to apply for permits so they felt that funnily enough that Brexit be, uh, brings some equality in the inequality as such if that makes sense um, but in general what I'm trying to say is that in both contexts what we see so in, in Britain and in Bulgaria there's this kind of ongoing um, perception of crisis and this this perception of crisis actually is multiple crises I think mm -hmm. that's what we need to be talking about because it's not just in Bulgaria it's not just um, in um, um, in the UK as well it's everywhere in Europe and not only in Europe I mean we just need to look across the pond and see what's happening in America as well um, but quite a few events have kind of uh, and lots of these different events that they're, they're very different but all of them somehow um, have been labelled together with this notion of crisis. So they're multiple and ongoing, um, but what they also symbolise is this rise of nationalism, effective nationalism. Um, and here I draw on uh, Manolis's work, who um, reminds us very usefully that um, actually, particularly when we consider migrant and local relations, we do need to look at these national discourses that come across very strongly in times of crisis. And we also need to do that, I would argue, not only when we look at the relations between migrants and locals, but also between migrants and non-migrants within a given ethnic group as such. So within this very large context, so my research has taken lots of different phases. Um, and phase one was in 2011 when I focused mostly on students um, and looked at their experiences. Then between 2013 and 14, I focused on high skilled professionals and I adopted a very broad and large um, definition of highly skilled migrants um, and I wanted to look at their experiences. My actually more recent work uh, is from 2018. So when I, um, I looked at um, other participants uh, who are not necessarily highly skilled. Funnily enough, um, every single one of them, regardless of the occupation that they had, and some of them were in really precarious occupations, he had a master's degree or an undergraduate degree. Um, so I think that is quite interesting. Um, they come from lots of different regions, so quite a few from uh, the Midlands, uh, where I'm based. Uh, I've done quite a bit of research in Scotland as well, uh, and uh, London and South um, South England as well, various different uh, qualitative methods, predominantly interviews uh, and participant observation. Participant observation has been more supplementary, um, both offline and um, online as well. So this is a little bit about the study. Now, finally get to the, 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 the main uh, argument and what I, what I argue is that in this very problematic and volatile contexts, um, Bulgarian migrants are exposed to various stereotypes that come across from the home and host society, but the way they counterbalance them is by actually drawing on, on this old mythical narrative of a Bulgarian enlightener, hence why I talked about enlighteners and the Bulgarian enlightenment. Um, so I, I would like to propose this model um, of um, identification that participants draw on um, and um, obviously it doesn't capture everybody's experiences, but I think it serves as an interesting indication of some, um, some characteristics of at least some of the participants. So um, the model is actually based on uh, an enlightener and an ambassador, and uh, they have a similar function but in different contexts. 
So who is an enlightener? So if you remember from uh, a few minutes ago when I was talking about the Bulgarian revival, those were people, um, uh, so the children of uh, rich Bulgarian merchants who had the opportunity to get educated abroad and bring back ideas to revive national consciousness. Um, so uh, some of my participants actually self-identify such as the new Bulgarian revi uh, enlighteners, um, who are people who have migrated uh, precisely so that they can get educated abroad, learn about new ideas and new opportunities, and then return to the country and implement them and improve the situation in the country. So this narrative very directly actually counterbalances um, the negative uh, discourses that come across from the home society that portray Bulgarians as traitors or as escapists. And one of my participants particularly is somebody called Buyam. He is a young professional, 23 years old. He works for a bank south in, in the south of England. And he spends quite a lot of time actually theorizing what he calls the second Bulgarian revival. So he has this theory. So when I ask him, oh, tell me a little bit about how you ended up here, he's like, no, I want to tell you about my theory, he said. And his theory is that all these Bulgarians, all these Bulgarian students who study at universities here in Oxford and Nottingham and Manchester, um, there's a huge student community in uh, Scotland as well. Um, so all of these people are not, uh, are not in the UK because they want to escape the situation. They want to improve the situation. They're here precisely to capture those ideas and go back and implement them. And he does precisely that in his everyday. So he's somebody who is a member of the board of several citizenship initiatives. Um, he even um, he volunteers and he even has a diary. And in this diary, he writes down ideas, various ideas that he's come across. And he spends a lot of time thinking about how they can be modified and implemented in Bulgaria as well. And he's not alone, but he's perhaps the, the, the starkest example. Uh, there are many of them um, who do so. And one of them is a uh, psychologist student, Carolina. So what she says in here, she lists a number of enlighteners like Botev, Karavelf, and so on and so forth. So what she says is that there are people who receive their education abroad prior to coming back to Bulgaria and making a difference. And here making a difference is this key. So it's quite interesting how migration is presented as the selfless act that is directed towards the improvement of the country and actually um, uh, bettering it. So they managed to inspire people, contributed more or less to the development of uh, the Bulgarian nation as a people, so that the country could exist. And I believe that many who study abroad are here because they want to go back afterwards and to contribute to the development of our country. Um, and she definitely doesn't um, think that these are people who are running away. So this very clearly um, counterbalances and kind of engages with these uh, negative uh, discourses. And for her, again, like this is almost uh, an altruistic, selfless act, or at least it's presented in that way. However, this is not always the case. So this narrative of the Enlighteners uh, is actually quite deeply problematic because it assumes that those who have stayed behind are in need of enlightenment. And this is, this is where the tension, again, between stayers and leavers resurfaces. And we can see an awareness of that in the comment made by Delan, who says that, again, he was very ambitious when he <coughs> came to the UK at first. You know, he had this idea that he will arrive here, he'll learn all these new crucial ideas, and by the time he's 40, he will be return and become the prime minister. I mean, that might happen one day, so watch, watch the space. Um, but uh, he also realizes that this choice is not seen necessarily as positively in Bulgaria. Um, and he recognizes that people who stay behind or in the country, they see us as outsiders that come from somewhere with the pretense to rule them. It's almost as if those who have once left are not counted as fellow citizens. Uh, and they've already given up once. So again, it's about giving up and escaping. Um, but he, again, argues that's not the case. And it's quite interesting because I think this is also making references uh, to this notion of political messianism. So uh, the, Bulgari the former Bulgarian king, Simeon Saksko Bogota, returned in 2001 and established his own party. And actually, his government did precisely, did, uh, precisely that. So it attracted a lot of 
um, foreign educated uh, individuals with lots of expertise in uh, different areas and promise to fix the country in 800 days. Never make such exact promises. <coughs> Similar to uh, uh, the British promise to get migration in the tens of thousands. Um, so um, you probably are aware that that didn't necessarily happen. And there was quite a lot of tension again that resurfaced with this idea of somebody coming from abroad. And, and in general, there is this kind of notion of somebody coming from abroad and fixing things. So the idea of the Messiah um, is historically and politically embedded. Like we can look at, like look towards Russia and how the strong Russian presence has been seen as against somebody coming from abroad and fixing and saving the nation. So this is this is really problematic, and there is an awareness of of that amongst uh, those who identify themselves as Enlightenists. There's the other kind of the counterpart to the Enlightenment that's more directed towards. Um, trying to counterbalance the negative image of Bulgarian migrants in the UK. And uh, very similar to the Enlighteners, um, but they're pretty much ambassadors of Bulgarian. What they do um, is they try to organize lots of different events to promote the culture and tradition, the rich culture and traditions of Bulgaria. And um, try to show a more positive image of Bulgarian. Usually um, that is... Um, um, it's actually quite prominent among students and student societies as well because they're very well organized and they organize lots of uh, cultural events that try to promote this. Uh, but also um, this is quite uh, strongly present in Vasil's words who is a young professional and he says that uh, when he finds himself in a situation uh, where they ask him where he's from, he precisely states that he's Bulgarian because he's noted that in those situations sometimes people might choose not to say I'm Bulgarian purely because of this negative association. It's, I don't think it's necessarily with being Bulgarian but rather the negative connotations of the term Eastern European. So what he says is that obviously phenotypically Bulgarians or Eastern Europeans are not necessarily different from the local population. Um, so if you see him somewhere in the street you wouldn't necessarily tell that he was Bulgarian. But he would like to counter that negative association by showing, well, actually, Bulgarians um, are really good people. We're very nice, very polite, highly educated. So uh, this is quite uh, quite a bit of a strategy of um, um, some of those people. And some, some of them see themselves as enlightened, but not everybody. So um, they, either, they try to be the best Bulgarian that they could be. So they present this positive image. Uh, which kind of is very similar to a social creativity uh, strategy by Tefal and Turner, social identification theory. So trying to um, kind of uh, present these positive qualities that then can be applied to the whole migrant group as such. And this is precisely what Camellia, for example, here says that uh, she actually thinks a lot about this, that um, um, you know, there's this negative image of Bulgarians and she's turned it into a cause to um, uh, counteract this. So uh, there is actually a slight difference, uh, this is what I forgot to say, between enlighteners and ambassadors, because um, the enlighteners are people who actually actively identify with this term, whereas an ambassador is more of an ethic term I've used to describe my participants and um, um, their actions and everyday practices. So what she says is that in spite of people who suck, uh, I label myself as Bulgarian and I try to be the best version of myself and a Bulgarian that someone can meet. So she even has the proper recipe of what it means to be the, be the best Bulgarian and that is, you know, focusing on uh, culture and the positives, the rich culture of the country and sharing it with everybody, which she certainly does uh, when there are national holidays such as Baba Mata where we exchange uh, brace, bracelets made for um, made out of red and white thread for good luck and so on and so forth. So these are some of uh, the strategies as well, but it's not only on individual level. Um, th this ambassadorial practice of spreading information about Bulgarians is also uh, a huge part of uh, Bulgarian communities, and there are firmly est established established. Uh, uh, Bulgarian communities in uh, certain parts of the UK, particularly in the Midlands, uh, down south as well. And it's, what, what is quite fascinating about them is it tends to be one individual that tries to unite uh, everybody. And particularly in the, Mid in, in the Midlands, there's this, um, uh, uh, this lady called Lily. And Lily is fantastic. She sews a national dress 
and she sources fabrics from everywhere. She had found a choreographer to teach all those Bulgarians who, quite frankly, apparently none of them knew how to dance traditional national dan dances when they were in Bulgaria, but they came to the UK to learn. Um, so all of them, uh, they practice every Sunday for three hours and they perform at various different events. So this picture, for example, and the one that was at the start was taken um, at a Bulgarian Open Day uh, organized in the Midlands uh, at the heart of Nottingham in a very multicultural area. Um, and uh, uh, they were sharing, so they had these posters and banners about who are Bulgarians, how Bulgarians say hi, um, and things like that. So lots of factual information about the alphabet and uh, uh, teaching people Bulgarian national uh, dances and trying to spread a more positive image that way as well. But obviously, uh, the ambassadors uh, themselves also have their own critics as well. So there are some participants that actually point out, well, what I do and my achievements have nothing to do with the country. In fact, they are in spite of the country, and in, sp in spite of the opportunities that have been presented to us. And also, particularly when we talk about Bulgarian communities, that might give the impression that Bulgarian diaspora is incredibly united. Um, but that's not the case. Uh, in fact, uh, it's rather the opposite. Um, and uh, one of the first things I got told uh, by a Bulgarian when I arrived was like, don't get to know too many Bulgarians. You know, if somebody, <coughs> if somebody uh, excuse my language, screws you over, it will be a Bulgarian. Uh, so, and this kind of perception actually has, uh, has uh, stayed really strongly. And some of these uh, people who actually agreed to participate in, uh, in the research, uh, they were trying to counterbalance it and say, well, we're not very united as a community, but I want to do my part. I want to help you with your research because I want to show that we can be otherwise. But there are quite a few divisions, and particularly um, those divisions are obviously uh, not only on the basis of nationality, so local population versus uh, migrant population, but also on the basis of class and educational level. And particularly the highly skilled migrants. So all of them point out, well, I'm not. I, uh, one of my participants, Kalina, she's a finance. Uh, um, she works in finance, and uh, she says, well, I'm not one of those people that came here to work at Tesco's or pick strawberries. I don't want to be associated with these people. And in fact, uh, in my participant observation with her, we had the situation once we um, were in a Turkish uh, takeaway, and uh, the girl that was working there was Bulgarian. And she was really pleased because obviously she heard us speak in Bulgarian. She was like, oh, hi, I'm very happy to meet you. Her body language, Kalina's body language completely changed. And she stopped talking. Yeah, yeah. And she said, well, let's leave, let's leave, let's go. And I was like, what's happened? Yeah. She's like, no, 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 I don't want to be associated with these people. So actually these class divisions and educated divisions, particularly um, around the community event that was organized. So I spoke to some <coughs> of the organizers and they said, well, look at our audience. All of them are highly educated because we don't want to be associated with these people, you know, who come here and steal and you know, uh, do all these dodgy things. We, we are actually different. So there is quite a lot of division. It's not uh, a homogenous group of people. And but, uh, finally, uh, this is some of the latest data, um, how identities are contested in times of uh, Britain. So quite a few um, of these participants, are, uh, obviously, at least they, they, they like the illusion of returning. Uh, but this quote comes from somebody who's lived here for 18 years uh, in the UK. And um, when I asked her about Brexit and how she feels, so she actually didn't want to return. She was somebody who was quite disillusioned. She worked as a lawyer in Bulgaria and was uh, really disillusioned with the judicial system um, and uh, came to the UK and now works for the NHS. So a completely different uh, position that um, has nothing to do with her previous education. Uh, but she wanted to be the best migrant ever and to integrate properly. And what she says, it's quite interesting, she talks about Brexit as a relationship. So it's quite emotional, again, um, that it feels like this lover who breaks up with you and you have this desperate hope that even though he's got three kids and a wife, he's going to still take you back. And she was really heartbroken to realize that this country, she says, large proportion of the country absolutely hates me. So she took it very personally. And she says, well, that's how I saw it. I saw it as a personal thing. And I've since realized that probably it's not always personal. It's not per uh, always personal, but for some people. So it's interesting how, uh, to see how these identities continue to be contested in different ways uh, for people who have stayed here uh, for a long time. And obviously, um, this will be quite problematic, uh, particularly 
uh, for those who would hope to vote in uh, European elections because um, um, there might be the chance that uh, after Brexit, uh, Bulgarian um, diaspora in the UK might not be able to vote because of a change in the law um, that is focused around settlement. So it's really interesting how these notions of settlement are so persistent and uh, they really clash with the idea of leading a transnational life. Um, and that doesn't necessarily correspond to the realities of most of these people. Oops. So finally, a few conclusions. Um, so this proposed model of the new enlightened ambassador is by no means perfect and all-encompassing, but I think it's a nice illustration of the fluidity of identities and how they change in these contexts. And I think it's really interesting, again, to see how leading a um, um, transnational life uh, uh, really becomes tangled up with uh, these notions of residence and settlement and the more one wants to uh, or hopes to lead, uh, lead a life that's not necessarily bound by national boundaries, the more there is this grounding um, and settlement, particularly in relation to identities and belonging. But um, what these um, kind of reactions of Bulgarian participants, uh, some of the Bulgarian participants in, uh, in my study show is that actually the Enlightenment ambassador, these routes to counterbalance negative uh, stereotypes. Um, and um, demonstrate uh, really oppositional agency. But they themselves also are slightly problematic because to a certain extent, again, they reaffirm this notion that uh, the division between stayers and leavers, they don't necessarily alleviate it because, again, um, to a certain extent, the enlightened discourse, again, presupposes that people who have stayed behind or um, not left the country are in need of uh, revival and uh, in need of enlightenment, uh, which uh, also might link uh, to some deeply problematic discourses of the myth of Eastern Europe as backward or the Balkans as such. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it, it is important to look at these national discourses and how they intersect with the lives of uh, migrants and non-migrants alike. And it's interesting to see how um, it's not necessarily sometimes non-migrants, but also uh, uh, sorry, not, um, uh, it's not necessarily the local population that becomes uh, the outgroup, but it could be also the fellow nationals who have not migrated. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for um, your attention and for listening to me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have.